Hello, everybody, and welcome to our um, Research Meets Activism, the A.M. Braden Institute's Research Meets Activism Breakfast. Um, what is traditionally a breakfast, this year it's a panel. Um, thanks for joining us. We've got a great uh, panel today, and I am going to hand it over to Ashley Hazley to get us started. Hello, hello, hello. Um, so my name is Ashley Hazley. Um, I'm the assistant director for the Muhammad Ali Institute for Peace and Justice here at University of Louisville. Um, first, I would like to thank um, Andy for inviting me to this space this morning and to be able to hold space with all of you this morning. Um, I would like to acknowledge all the amazing work that you have done to make sure um, that yesterday's lecture and today's panel happened and was and will be amazing. It's been such a pleasure working with you as we continue to find authentic and intentional ways to partner and spread the messages which our institutes are centered. Um, so during some of our initial conversations about Peace and Justice Week, we got into quite a deep dialogue about all the ways in which reproductive justice shows up in our daily lives. And I remember asking you uh, if I could be real with you about my own understanding of reproductive justice. And of course, you're someone that always invites in, so you allowed me that space. Um, and at that time, I confided in you that it was more recently that I began to grasp the fact that reproductive justice was more uh, was about more than just the right to have an abortion. I had a very limited view of that um, for a lot of my life. Narratives surrounding birth control restrictions, um, so sorry, my allergies, support for those who do not um, want to parent, alternatives for queer folks such as myself who do want to parent, and allowing folks to choose how to parent in a way that maintains the human rights of them and their child as they thrive in safe and healthy communities just had been included in my perspective. So. Of course, I no longer think that way. Um, and I've had experiences and conversations that have helped me to include the full framework in my definition of reproductive rights. And with that in mind, I'm also excited to hear the words of today's panel as we further, as they further enlighten us on the intersection of reproductive justice and racial justice. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Um, especially for being willing to share some of those pieces about um, the conversations that we were having. Um, I felt very privileged to be able to put this panel together. Um, all of the people that we're gonna hear from today, I know well and have a deep respect for both personally as well as professionally. And I'm really excited to see how they all interact together. Um, so with that, we're going to get started. Um, I am going to give a very quick 
um, name and title introduction, but then each, if each of our panelists will just say something about themselves real quick, and we'll go in the order of Damara, Aaron, Kabira, and um, Adrian. Okay, so Damara Jenkins is a nurse midwife, a certified nurse midwife at the University of Louisville Hospital, um, and has been in practice many, many years. We've been friends probably for eight years, something like that. Anyway, so I'm um, super excited to have Damara. Um, Aaron Smith is the executive director of the Kentucky Health Justice Network and is doing all kinds of amazing work statewide. Um, Kabiri Yakini is the soon to be director of Mama to Mama, a local non for profit that is um, a collective, a cooperative of parents supporting parents and families supporting each other and is doing work with BLM Louisville. And Adrian Smith is a UofL health and social justice scholar. Um, she is studying public health and her studies are primarily on the intersection of race and the criminal justice system that manifests in maternal and infant health as well as HIV research. So we're really excited to have all of you. So Damara, if you'll say a few words, Erin, Kabira, and then Adrian. Okay, so I am the Director of Midwifery and Women's Health at UofL Health and happen to be the first nurse midwife practicing in hospitals in Louisville. Um, I have held various officer roles for Kentucky Affiliate of American College of Nurse Midwives. Uh, currently, I am the legislative liaison. I sit on the Maternal Mortality Review Committee for the state, um, and I am part of the work group that's forming the Kentucky Perinatal Quality Collaborative, as well as I precept lots of nurse midwife and nurse practitioner students. In all those roles, I do some form of reproductive racial justice work. <laughs> Hello, I'm Erin Smith, and as Andrea said, I am the executive director of the Kentucky Health Justice Network. Uh, with KHAN, we stand on three firm pillars of who we are and what makes us who we are. The first is abortion support. We have an abortion hotline which receives probably thousands of calls a year from across the state of Kentucky. Um, we also have All Access Eastern Kentucky, which allows us to um, have reproductive materials and support throughout Eastern Kentucky, as well as Eastern Kentucky University. And we also have trans rights and trans health advocacy, which we talk more about trans health and reproductive justice. So it's a little bit of what I do. Um, I also work very closely with uh, Louisville Pride Foundation as the co-chair in which we're able to uh, start moving in more reproductive conversations into the dialogue within the foundation and community conversations. Hello, I am Kabiri Yakini. Um, I am, like Andrea said, the soon to be director of Mama to Mama. Um, also work under Chanel Helm um, through BLM Louisville for Sister Song. Um, I'm grateful to be here. We are revamping Mama to Mama and what that looks like um, to be inclusive and supportive of the entire community and the reproductive justice side of things. Thank you for having me. Hello everyone. Um, again, my name is Adrienne Smith. I am a second year doctoral student in the School of Public Health. Um, my, like she said, my research interests are heavily centered around the intersection of criminal justice um, and what that means for African Americans here um, in the United States and how that manifests through health in a variety of ways. Um, but my two main intersections are maternal and child health. Um, as well as HIV research. Um, I typically look at my research through a transdisciplinary social justice perspective. Um, and with that, um, I work with um, the consortium uh, for transdisciplinary so uh, social justice research. Um, and also I'm a health and social justice scholar. Um, and I'm just honored to be here with um, all these amazing community workers. Um, and I just continue to hope to uh, build my 
my work in academia to continue to bridge that gap between academia and community because I believe that we all have um, knowledge that needs to be centered um, so that we can begin to really make some structural changes around reproductive justice. All right. I am so excited. This is going to be great. Okay, so we, for the purposes of this, the conversation today, we're using the Sister Song Reproductive Justice Framework, which, um, as Ashley uh, said earlier, looks like uh, says that everyone has the right to bodily autonomy, the right to parent, the right not to parent, and the right to parent the children that we have in safe and sustainable communities. So I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to talk about um, the ways that these, these principles show up in their work. Um, it's a broad question and mostly I just want the panelists to dig a little bit deeper into the frameworks that they use within their given work or studies. So we'll go in that same order, Damara, um, Aaron, Kabira, and Adrian. Sorry, one of the ways in which I've done this work, um, when I started the midwifery program, um, I designed it um, to make sure that the midwives were able to practice according to the midwifery model of practice. Um, that was very important to me. And so that includes um, being inclusive, practicing evidence-based medicine, shared decision-making, um, and I really have worked hard to make sure that we have as few barriers as possible to care. Um, in fact, my t-shirt says, the future is accessible. <laughs> um, one of the other things I've done as, as I've been there um, and have been awakened to a lot of the issues uh, in particular by Andrea <laughs> is to, I've always been um, a priest receptor for students because we need more um, providers of color and so I, I and we're one of the few midwifery practices in the area that will take students and so I always give preference to students of color um, if I have to choose um, and if I have if I have a student that needs a space even if I really don't have the space for them I find a way um, other than that um, the Maternal Mortality Review Committee is about a, for the state is about a year and a half old. Um, and when I came to that, um, you know, my biggest thing has been to make sure that everyone understands that one of the biggest risk factors for these women is racism. Um, and so to include when we're discussing the different cases, we need to discuss all the things that are involved and not just the um, straight medical facts. Um, for instance, um, someone's eth ethnic or racial background was not always a given that we would get that information. And so now we do, we get it on everyone. I also made sure that other black providers were on that um, committee because um, I was the only one at first. Um, other ways um, that I have done things, I have presented on Black maternal mortality and infant and Black infant mortality um, to uh, nurse practitioner groups and nurse midwife groups in the state. Um, and then as my role as an officer with American College of Nurse Midwives, um, I have worked really hard to make sure that that organization and midwifery organizations in the state were inclusive. So I tried to, I'm try, trying to break down walls between all the different types of midwives in the state. Um, and um, at the beginning of the year before COVID started, I was starting a push to get all the midwives in the state, um, not just nurse midwives, all of us, um, to undergo implicit bias training. Um, and so I've started that back up. 
Um, other things I've done in this community, um, most recently, I um, encourage folks to get together and do something in our community for Black Breastfeeding Week. And um, my next thing is to get a group together so that we have community events uh, during Black Maternal Health Week. Um, oh, there's probably other stuff, but. That's a big Tomorrow. Okay, Erin, you're up. So, um, fun fact, I took this position in May of 2020. So, uh, I do not recommend starting uh, during COVID, but it, <laughs> it was a great learning experience. And one of the things that I learned coming into uh, KSJN was that uh, the need for a shift in RJ is greatly needed. And on the outside, when I was just looking on the outside and participating in reproductive justice work uh, before uh, being coming executive director of a reproductive justice organization was that RJ has always um, seemed very, very white and very white woman centered, right? And that's the number one problem that we are still facing within RJ. I will say that so many organizations um, have contributed to turning the tide with that sister song um, being one of those organizations. Um, and um, it's been a slow go at it, but it's picking up momentum. So one of the things that I knew coming into KHN was that that has got to change. So started in looking um, at how we can be more a part of the Louisville community because I knew that um, as much support as we do give, our information is not distributed widely through West and South Louisville at all, um, which, you know, we are a small staff, but at the same time, there was not much focus on giving out and, distri and distributing information, reaching out to those areas. And I'll also include my neighborhood too of, of Newburgh and West Beachel, which is where I grew up here in Louisville. Uh, so I knew that was something that we had to change. So with this year, despite all the things, did our best to partner uh, with organizations to try and, and include uh, the intersectionality of not just you know gender and gender identity, but also race as well. And talk about, um, discuss more about the high mortality rate, rate of, of, um, of black people dying after childbirth or having issues with pregnancy and not receiving proper care. We've talking, having more conversations about um, black infant mortality, black and brown infant mortality, um, cause I feel like that's also left out of the conversation. And we were able to do that successfully with our Take Root Conference. That was one of the main things that we talked about this year during our first virtual conference um, during COVID. And, it was a very well welcome thing. And so many people were happy to listen and not just talk about it and just receive all the information that some people were aware, some people were not aware of, you know, different states and their numbers. And also uh, along with those conversations, trying, trying to just change the overall scope of discussing reproductive justice, which includes um, abortion as a part of reproductive health care, which is something that is not also talked about. The dialogue thus far has been, um, you know, abortion, everyone should have to write to an abortion, but because the way the dialogue and honestly the media has framed that, it seems completely separate uh, from overall reproductive health, which is not true. Um, this is something that we find that we have to carry over into our conversations with Eastern Kentucky, going to more conservative areas, um, whether South or you know our neighbors, you know West Virginia. That is a, a, a discussion that we still have a hard time getting people to realize. So in the areas of you know race and reproductive justice, there's still a lot of work to be done, but I'm glad to say that we've been able to um, partner with Russell Place of Promise in distributing uh, what we called uh, cuffing season care packages, which contained a box of emergency contraception, um, condoms, lube, and of course, 
KHJN's calling card with all of our information. And we were able to distribute about 250 bags with Russell and whatever bags we had left over, we were able to donate to Change Today, Change Tomorrow. And for our 2021 strategic plan, which we are currently developing, we've made it a focal point and a goal to start reaching out to neighborhoods um, and other clinics that exist in West and South Louisville uh, to make sure that we can try to build those partnerships within our Louisville community to you know, make sure that people always have access to reproductive um, information, abortion information, trans health information, because that's another population that is often let, left out of reproductive conversations, right? Because people, for whatever reason, can't imagine, even though we're seeing it more and more, people for some whatever reason, reason doesn't, don't see um, trans people having kids and wanting to actually birth kids and carry kids, which is frustrating, but it, it's a part of that dialogue that needs to change along with the scope of reproductive justice. That goes like with the inclusion of what happens, needs to happen within reproductive justice. Um, and also to giving more attention to black and brown trans individuals and changing the language from a mostly female or woman-based language to a more all-inclusive language, like using pronouns of they instead of she, you, you know, acknowledging that some people choose not to identify with the gender, acknowledging that, um, that the term motherhood can be triggering for some people, especially someone who is trans or gender non-conforming or uh, non-binary, you know, using the terms um, uh, parental carrier or fetal carrier or parent guardian, however, you know, and asking the patient, how would you like to be, you know, identified throughout, you know, this pregnancy and this, you know, process of you carrying your child. And it, it seems like it's a lot of work because it is, I'm not going to downplay that whatsoever, but it's happening. And, you know, as much as we want change to happen quickly, it does take that work, um, and that diligence and, and attention to detail for it, it to start. And I think that, you know, KSGN is, is able to have those conversations. Uh, Sister Song has definitely spearheaded a lot of those conversations and I'm glad to have been a part of some of those. Uh, even Planned Parenthood has, is starting to spearhead some of those conversations as well. So I think one of the things to look forward to in the future is just the frame of reproductive health and reproductive justice expanding to become more all-inclusive, especially in the areas of race, gender, and sexual identity. Thanks, Erin. Kabira? Um, so I started with Mama to Mama four years ago. Um, and one of the things that was most important to me is um, being able to train more women of color to become doulas, people of color to become doulas. Um, that was something I accomplished and am still accomplishing with being with Mama to Mama. We have had um, two face-to-face -face, um, doula trainings. Uh, what year is this, 2020? Uh, it started in 2018 um, and had one last year, of course. And we had 24 um, women of color come through and become doulas. Um, and this year we had a virtual training and we've had about 10 um, women of color come through and become birth doulas. Um, the biggest thing for me is education and getting that education out to my communities. Um, I learned about birth doulas and midwives when I got pregnant with my third child. Um, actually before that, just doing research on my own, um, but everybody doesn't have that accessibility. Um, so that was something that was very important to me coming in Mama to Mama. Growing with Mama to Mama and becoming the director as of next year, what is important to me now is changing the name. Um, over the past year, it's been something that's been on my mind because I say birthing person now. Um, I have a lot of people around me that are non-binary and I respect everybody, every single human being and how they choose to live their life. 
Um, Mama to Mama is very inclusive and we're open to everybody. And we ask those questions like on our intake form, how do you like to be identified? But our name doesn't say that. Um, so as the new director coming up, that's something that I'm working towards. To, so if y'all got any ideas, come to me with some names. Um, but yes, that is having access to um, things that white women have access to has been my driving point. Um, uh, there's an emergency training coming up in December that costs a lot of money. We don't have access to things like that. Um, so we have to get sponsorships and we have to get um, scholarships if they're available. And that's something in the West End, the South End, New, I grew up in Newburgh and Butchell as well. Um, so being in those populations of people and educating them is something that has to be done. Um, I'm also not one of those people that I don't like tracking those populations. That's something that drives me crazy when it comes to um, giving resources to these specific communities. Um, I know it's something that has to be done in order to get resources, but that's always been an issue of mine. Um, like making sure we get all the numbers or we get 30 people of color and we make sure that we're doing all of these things and reporting that data. Um, so I know I can't get around that, but <laughs> uh, yeah, education is my biggest driving point when it comes to people of color, black and brown indigenous people, because we lack the accessibility to be able to have it at our fingertips. Um, so that's my driving point and that's what I move with every single day. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Adrian. Yeah, so I'm going to come at it from a different angle as far as like research and academia is concerned and utilizing the sister song reproductive framework. And so for, I guess, my research interests, when we think about people who because I'm, I'm, I'm learning, I'm trying to change my language as well to become more inclusive. And I think that's also, before I get to what I was gonna say before, it's kind of hard to, um, in academia, because like there are such strong like paradigms there, like there are such strong traditional things, like even just language that we are trying to use to even talk about the issue is like not inclusive. And so it's like trying to, trying to push the agenda to say that this is something that needs to be researched, this is something that needs to be brought to the forefront, but also not even having the language to even really, in, in academia, um, to really explain what's going on. And so when you think about people who are incarcerated, who are um, parents, like even the incarceration system, it's male and female. And so there's no place for trans folk, there's no place for non-binary folk. And so it's just like, even that in itself, um, is going against what this framework is telling us to do as far as accessibility is concerned. Um, and then just the incarceration piece in general is, if we're being honest, the system was made to dehumanize you. And so when you dehumanize a person, you take away their right. Um, and that is their right to parent or their right to not parent, you know, that is their bodily autonomy. Um, so like some people come in and they're not even given a pregnancy test. Um, so they find out, you know, four months later that they're pregnant and, you know, you can't necessarily get an abortion if that's something that you want to do. So like now you're being forced into parenthood where that's not, maybe not something that you wanted to do if you were um, on the outside. Um, you think about things like just general parenting things. Now, nowadays, there are some prisons who um, have things called prison nurseries that allow um, parents to be with their children or have their children incarcerated with them up to, you know, maybe their sentences, maybe three years. Um, but that is far and few in between. And there are hundreds of prisons, a majority of, um, forgive me for my language, but majority of women, I guess, or people who have wounds, <laughs> who can bear babies, um, majority of them are housed in jails, um, in local jail facilities. And so it's like, they don't even have um, 
the access to something like a prison nursery, which is important. So when I come at it from a research perspective, I'm trying to like take all these things and bring them together and present it to whomever who will listen. So whether that is just, you know, providing to literature, if that's, um, I would really love to see um, this research be used for policy, to inform policy, to um, change those um, outcomes for people who are parenting in prison. Um, like even when we think about here in Louisville or in the surrounding area, Pee Wee Valley um, Women's um, Correctional Facility, they take all the pregnant inmates and put them there in the state of Kentucky. And so if you think about the state of Kentucky, if say you're from somewhere out east and you're bringing brought um, 30 minutes outside of Louisville, you already have children, or if you are pregnant, like you're not being able to see your family, like those resources are being taken care taken from you. Like we know that social support is like critical to um, maternal and infant health. And so when you take those things away, it's just it's just detrimental to the mother or the parent, to the child, to the community um, and their families. And so that is where I'm coming from as far as the research is concerned, is taking is looking at the fact that the incarceration system is simply not employing the this framework of reproductive justice. And how can we do that when this is something that has been in, in its form for years and it's hard to reform. Um, and so just looking at what are some ways that we can actually change that. Thank you, everyone. Um, so the next question, and one of the things that I really felt like was important to talk about in this panel really is the intersection of structural and police violence with reproductive justice. Um, there are lots of pieces of that conversation that I think it is helpful to hear from people like the folks on our panel today, because they're seeing and experiencing and providing support um, in these very uh, unacknowledged ways. So I'm gonna ask all of our panels in about three minutes, and I'm sorry that's uh, not a lot of time, three to four minutes each, to talk about the ways that, that this kind of violence shows up in, in your work and your studies. So, and we'll go in the same order, Damara, Aaron, Kabira, Adrian. Uh. Um, I have to say, I wasn't as really clear about how to answer this at first, but then talking with my daughter helped me to understand that not even just this year, but the folks that I work with um, deal with structural and, you know, police violence on the daily basis, or at least the after, the aftermath of that. And so that shows up in, um, in their health status. And, um, and, and so it just goes back to the fact that um, racism is a huge risk factor for um, a lot of, uh, you know, potential bad outcomes um, for, the, for the folks that I take care of. Um, and that I need to really work on making sure that the care that I provide does its best to mitigate some of that. Um, other than that, um, you know, I see how folks that are, you know, around me, um, the type of care that they receive, um, and how that how that plays um, a role. And, and a lot of times, it's not it's not intended. It's not it's not even understood that they're doing it. Um, my biggest example would be that um, I have noticed that. In this area, Black women don't have access to VBAC. Um, black folks don't have access to VBAC as much as um, white folks. And um, I think that's twofold. I think that's people assuming they can't do it. There's this myth in the area that um, Black folks either will birth vaginally very easily or they're just always going to be a C-section because that's how Black folks do that. Um, in the healthcare world. I don't know where that comes from. Um, and so folks are, um, are not, um, they're counseled differently 
um, black folks are counseled differently than white folks when it comes to that. Um, and we, we see that same thing. I can't hear you, Andrew. Oh, VBAC is vaginal birth after cesarean. Um, and so making sure that folks have access to vaginal birth after cesarean is a really important measure um, to reduce bad outcomes um, in the work that I do. That's just a small, that's just a small, like obvious thing. There's lots of things. It shows up all kinds of ways in the work that I do. Thank you, Aaron. So um, with all that has happened in the area of uh, police brutality and, and seeking justice, one thing that I can say that has happened, at least from my perspective, and that I'm seeing more of is that um, the, there is a broader, you know, there's more inclusion of all frames of justice, which has you know, now come to the forefront of multiple conversations. Um, I know I talked about the expanding conversation with the RJ to be more inclusive of all intersectionalities, but along with that, we're also more a part of just, you know, all the, you know, the racial violence that's going on, because we also see it in, with um, Black people in healthcare, uh, with uh, birthing, you know, birthing persons who are Black or Brown, you know, discriminate, uh, being discriminated against openly, but I'll take it even a step further to say that here in Louisville, we have the EMW clinic. Uh, the EMW clinic is a, is a full-time abortion clinic here in Louisville. Um, and we have some of the most, uh, <laughs> the most aggressive uh, anti-abortion protesters in the country. Uh, and, and that adds to you know this discussion of violence and violence against you know black you know, persons because these protesters in particular are known to you know to stalk and follow and harass and and grab you know on the shoulder or by the hand uh, individuals who are trying to seek care however they see fit for themselves right going back to that full body autonomy they're doing everything from, you know, uh, taking pictures and posting these individuals online to calling family members and saying, well, did you know this, your child or your niece, or nephew, or whatever was seen outside of this clinic. And it's, you know, they're going through all these lengths to uh, dehumanize a person, right? To shame them. And that's something that we see on a, on a daily basis. Anytime that, you know, we have, fortunately, you know, we do have a very close relationship with our clinic escorts. Uh, they're not our clinic escorts, they're another organization that do, you know, clinic escorting, but we have a close relationship with them. And when we were building our safety zone um, ordinance, which did not pass in a primarily democratic majority metro council, our safety zone did not pass. Let that sink in for a second. It lost by, it, it was defeated by three votes. Right. And all three of those votes were from individuals who argued religion and religious beliefs over body autonomy and over a person's right to choose what they want to do with their body. Right. So what that did was that it took away a safety option for patients coming into this clinic. So because of that, we get calls on our hotline. You know, if the clinic isn't booked up, it's something like, I don't want to go there because the protesters are, you know, terrified me, or I'm afraid, or I don't feel protected, my identity is not protected, I don't want to be uh, put on blast for, you know, seeking care for myself. And so I think it's something that um, I see very frequently and seeing increase an increased number of, especially really right now um, in the times that we're facing, I know, you know, with not just Donald Trump era, but, you know, we had to go through Matt Bevin, we had to go through all these other things involving state government as well, uh, which I think is often neglected, is that we have a larger attack in state government than we do um, any place else right now, because it's, it's just, it's just something that 
we've had to, you know, learn to navigate around. And uh, we're not the only city or state that has to deal with violence or yeah, violence outside of, of abortion clinics, but it's definitely you know, has added to uh, the weight that we feel with everything and the protests and demonstrations and the, the heavy aggression and violence from the police here. And it's all taking place downtown in the same area, blocks away from each other, but still in the same area, the same type of violence, whether it's coming from the police or the anti-protesters, it's there and it's felt very heavily amongst us. We've had to make sure that um, our escorts, you know, that they feel supported by us. We've had to make sure that um, I've had members of my staff go on, go downtown and be um, um, medic, uh, medic, service medics for the protesters. Um, and to just continue and just check in and it forces us to check in with each other. It forces us to support each other more, but it also forces us to see that the range of what is included in just overall justice is much broader than what a lot of people originally viewed um, before 2020. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Kabira? Um, in my role in the work that I do <clears throat> with Mama to Mama, um, I don't encounter as far as the police brutality too much. Aftermath, yes, um, because I deal, I work with a lot of Black and Brown Indigenous people, um, and I work specifically and live in these communities. Um, what I do find is like what Damara was talking about, VBEX. I haven't had a white woman. I haven't had a white woman as a client before. All my clients have been black and brown people. And if it's a client that has had a C-section before, it's like pulling teeth to try to get them, um, their healthcare professional to respect their wishes and want to try a VBAC um, unless they go see Damara. Um, I find that I also work with when the father's in the home, I'm also re working on relationship stuff with black and brown families um, because of structural racism and how um, I'm going to use, I guess, triggering words, but how the black man was taken out of the home and um, people that choose to live a monogamous life traditional with man and woman, um, I find myself being a relationship coach, I guess, um, and trying to help through the society we live in and how um, the world views the Black man. Um, that's a lot of my work um, that I do, as well as if the father is not in the home, um, I'm holding a lot of space for that person that identifies as a mother, as a woman. Um, I've had two babies with non-binary couples and um, one was an interracial couple and one was a couple of color. And I didn't have the same, obviously it was different um, with the couple of color a lot of the same conversations around structural racism and how black and brown people are viewed in the world and how we're treated um, and how we're not giving the same treatment in the hospital. Um, and then on top of that, if you're in um, a same sex relationship, the issues you have to deal with there um, and not being respected as the partner of this, of this um, other person and being non-binary or the mother and father, however you identify to this baby, not being respected as such, um, not being respected as a partner and a loving partner in this relationship and with the birthing of this baby. Um, I'm sorry, this gets me very emotional because it just, it bothers me highly. Um, because I love all human beings and we should all be respected and all should be given the same care and education. And that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, Adrian. Yeah. Um, so with my research and with previous research, the impacts of structural racism is woven throughout um, just what we look at maternal mortality rates and just maternal uh, morbidity for uh, black women compared to non-Hispanic white women, the, <laughs> the disparity is vast. And even when you control for social economic status, um, the disparity is still there. And so the only thing left to work with is race. And I could go on and on uh, about how, how pervasive racism is and how it has impacted maternal mortality rates. Um, even when we have midwives here, so even when you look at the history of like um, granny midwives um, early on in the, in the 1900s and throughout, like just there are various different policies that have taken place that, to take that out, like the, the growing of the field of gynecology, um, just all of these different things. But when I hone in on um, incarcerate, incarcerated people, we see this, this paradox that exists, um, which is really interesting because for what, what research has found is that contrary to what you might believe about um, birth outcomes for incarcerated people, um, they remain pretty standard or pretty constant compared to the general population. And so when you look at why it's because um, incarcerated people are the only people in this country who are by law um, mandated to get care um, because they are under the facilities um, care. And so they get that constant care. Now, is it optimal? That is questionable depending on where they're at, um, but they get that, they get, you know, the, typically, hopefully three meals a day, they have a steady um, place to sleep. Um, and so all these things um, typically allow for non-Hispanic white women to have similar birth outcomes to those compared to the outside world. But when you look at Black um, black women and Hispanic women, um, the rate still is still not there. So it's like, how what are we accounting for now? So like we're in a controlled environment um, that should serve as a protective factor, which research says, but it's not. And it's just like we have um, a Hispanic and Black women are overrepresented in the incarcerated population, and it's increased by like 800% since the 80s. And that's directly due to the result of um, the war on drugs and um, extreme drug um, policing. And so you just see it woven throughout. So it's just everywhere and it's, it's extremely hard to combat. Um, and as a researcher, the issue is always how do we how do we measure race like how do we actually research race and I think that's the issue for people who don't want to see it as an issue structural racism as an issue that is impacting um, uh, maternal mortality or reproductive justice or even infant outcomes it's just like yes we can measure it in a way, but because it is not a concrete thing, it's an abstract thing that has been created um, to create a hierarchy between people. It's just like, it's, I know that, you know, my, my cohort and my friends who are currently um, in school right now, and I know that, you know, our professors, we're all like trying to wrap our mind around how are we going to really tell this story to get people to understand that like, this is actually an issue um, and it's, it goes beyond, um, I mean, it, it is important, you know, like the medical um, professionals and their biases and their discrimination, but it goes beyond that. It's such a bigger picture, um, especially for incarcerated folks as well. Thank you. Um, so we've talked a fair bit about how racism shows up in the lives of people. Um, and we've talked a lot about the, way, the intersection of that that happens when we're talking about people's bodies, pregnancy, um, but also our reproductive health care from a broad perspective. Um, and so we've talked a lot about what's not going well. I want to give all of our panelists the opportunity to sort of wave a magic wand 
And I'd like to think about that in, in two ways. What are, what are some policy issues that if implemented would improve your community? What do you need from, um, from a policy standard, be that statewide or citywide, what are some concrete issues that can be attacked from that, from that way? And then how, how would that manifest in the community? What would that look like if you were to get these, um, this structural piece in place to support the work that you're doing? Okay, Damara. Okay. Um, one, I would say um, access to midwifery care would be one of the things, increased access. So we need money. We need money for more midwives to be in practice. We need money to have more space for more, more midwives to be in practice. And we need money to do what Kabira was talking about, was, is to get the word out and education to folks that midwifery care is available and, um, and necessary um, to improve the health for everyone. So uh, there are several ways to get that money. Um, some of them are as simple as um, increasing reimbursement for midwifery care. Um, currently, uh, midwives uh, and uh, nurse practitioners are reimbursed at 75% of the physician fee in the state of Kentucky. Um, there are, there are other things like the, mid, the maternal mortality review committee that was just started a year and a half ago was able to be started and be effective because there was some legislative change that allowed us access to records. Um, and then there was money, there was a grant that came um, and that money was designed to help combat, combat a substance abuse and the outcomes from that um, for newborns and for, more than 50% of the maternal deaths in the state are due to overdose um, as one of the causes. Um, so, but we need money to attack uh, racism. So um, what, what has come out of that is that a, a big focus of the Maternal Retire Review Committee and now the Perinatal Quality Collaborative is, uh, is uh, you know, fighting substance abuse and overdose. Um, but we need money to fight uh, racism too. So um, other than that, there are other policy changes would just be things that make it easier for um, midwives to practice um, and for folks to have access to care. So there's uh, some legislation now to try to make it easier to get birth centers. We don't have any freestanding birth centers in the state um, and we need legislation. We've got um, licensing for certified professional midwives, which is amazing. Um, and now we need some legislative change to make it easier for nurse midwives to practice truly independently. Um, and then uh, just supporting um, legislation um, like Attica Scott has a bill and one of the components of her bill is implicit bias training for um, you know, all the practitioners in the state. Um, and it, it, but it, that's a great start, but it needs to go further. We're gonna to have to force people to do it. <laughs> Aaron. Um, so overall, I just need what like for what everything that you know K Shane does. What we need is just people to put, you know, just respect Roe v. Wade. It has gone through so many courts. Just respect it. It's here, like just get over it, like right. Um, just respect it and with everything that is SCOTUS and now we're, you know, trying to see how we can turn Georgia and flip the Senate and all these other things. Like the number one thing that everyone decides to pick on is always abortion access, the right to an abortion. And I just, just respect it. You know, I don't know how many times you can keep, I feel like there should be a limit on how many times you can bring up something unless there is a huge change within the practice, there really should be a limit for that because there is something like that is always changed in the house um, or at the state level here, um, Attorney General Daniel Cameron is trying to bring up the same thing that was defeated last uh, legislative session, which is just uh, 
just nitpicking at like last session, it was about the width of the hallways, making sure the hallways and all medical facilities can be accessible for a stretcher in case there's an ambulance that has to come, which is indirectly attacking, attacking, you know, uh, abortion clinics, right? And then this session is going to be, oh, well, all clinics, all medical clinics need to have a contract with the ambulance company and provider to, in case, you know, you know, something happens and they have to be rushed to a hospital, which is going to take money away from abortion clinics. Um, and which is also fairly redundant because um, EMW already has like their, a great system in place and they do have U of L doctors which practice at that clinic and they are shared with U of L health. So once again, it's just nitpicky little things to try to just inadvertently attack abortion access and the right to an abortion within the state. Um, that is my biggest thing. It's just like respect Roe v. Wade, stop coming after it. It's not gonna change. There is a precedent. There's a long standing precedent. No matter what type of Supreme Court justice you're gonna put in the United States, it is already a precedent there. Um, and she is very anti, you know, anti anything progressive pretty much. Um, and the second thing for me would be sex education. There has to be a better sex education within schools telling you know kids how you know what reproduction is from a heterosexual sense is so limiting you have so much you have to include everything within sex education you have to include reproductive health to the extent that includes abortion you have to include um gay sex or uh homosexuals. You have to just include transness. You have to include all these things within sex ed. And it's more damaging. There's more damage being done by the lack of structure within sex ed than there is like from what you know people want to make you believe like, oh, um, porn is poisoning our kids. Like, no, that's the sex education they're trying to get that they're not getting. And they're seeking it out in the only way they know how, which is through the internet. Yeah, it can be very misleading and not 100% accurate, but it's what is available because it's not being provided in, a, in an educational structured environment. And there's this, you know, fear about, well, we don't want them to know too much. Well, then you don't want them to knew, know anything. You know, you can't teach bits of the whole truth. And we're still doing that with history, but that's a whole nother tangent I can go on. I don't feel like doing it today, but that's the two main things that I see that is needed legislatively, just stop messing with Roe v. Wade and to provide better sex education overall. I love it. Thank you. Kabira. So what I had to say, I second what Aaron said. I second what Damara said. All of that. Check it off. Stamp it. Mail it. Do not return the sender. Um, my also biggest thing is cis men should not be creating laws or making decisions around reproductive justice. Um, so if I had a magic wand, like that's what I would instantly like, you have no say so, go sit back and have several seats in the back. Um, that's my biggest thing. Um, of course, the education, in order to get education out, we have to have money. Money makes the world go round. We have to function with it in order to live. I look at money differently now, like um, it's just something we have to have. Also the sex education piece, I have a 17 year old and an 11 year old, um, two boys, um, and I have a four year old daughter and I have an eight month old son. Sex education is something we start in the household. Um, I know education and all of those things are supposed to happen in your household first. Um, but some children that are brought into this world don't have that accessibility, don't have parents or guardians um, that are able to even educate them on things like that because they weren't educated. So then that's when it takes the community to step in, school, other organizations, whatever the case may be to make that piece happen. Um, and that also has to have money to back that in order to get it distributed out into the community. So. Yes, I second both of them and add in that cis men have no, no decision-making roles in my world. Adrian, take it away. <laughs> I 100% agree with all of y'all. Definitely that. Um, 
I mean, I feel like if I had a magic wand, definitely all of those things, um, adding on to that, or I guess maybe just expanding, I definitely think that there needs to be policy change that addresses that structural violence um, that we see and getting down to those root causes. And this is me coming from a public health part, but looking at those social determinants of health um, and things that just prevent people from even getting access to things that they need to, you know, have that reproductive justice. Um, so again, with my theme of incarceration, um, preventing people from even getting incarcerated in the first place. Like we don't, like people don't need to be incarcerated, especially a uh, majority of these people who are, they are in there for nonviolent um, drug offenses. Like they don't need to be taken away from their children. They don't need to need to be in an incarcerated um, incarceration facility, trying to deal with the pregnancy. Um, that is just unnecessary. Um, so I think that really having policy that actually addresses those root causes and prevent that prevent people from um, being able to execute their reproductive justice um, in the first place is something that I would change. Um, and then also, I think that like maternal review boards are something that we need to see um, a lot more of and we need to have them more standardized and there needs to be something like that for um, the incarcerated um, population as well, um, because there are no mandates, there are no federal governing standards or anything. So like, as far as research is concerned, like I'm literally like just taking what I can because there's no information out there or there it's not accessible or it's not correct. Um, so just kind of standardizing um, how we look at um, that care. Um, can help us have a better view on how we can improve it and make sure that it is accessible for everyone. Thank you. Um, panel, thank you so much. I think that the conversation we had today, the pieces that you all are pulling together for us range, just help us create an understanding of the scope of reproductive justice, how that incorporates policy and um, specific structural issues, as well as the experiences of individual people and their bodies and how so many different variables there are. Um, the communities that we live in and the ways that we are situated um, in our lives and the way and how many opportunities there are for both positive interactions with, um, with our, with healthcare as well as, um, as well as those connections to the community. So uh, I just wanna say thank you for really helping us expand this conversation and include pieces that I think don't get talked about enough. Um, we are Excited to have uh, Loretta Ross here with us today. Um, and I'm gonna invite her to come and give some observations and remarks. Um, and then we'll have Q&A in a little bit. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. And I certainly enjoyed hearing about the great work taking place in Kentucky. It's probably been close to 15 or 20 years ago when I was in Kentucky doing the first training on reproductive justice for the Kentucky Health Justice Network. And so I love to see your development and the progress that you've made. Uh, one observation I made though, was somehow omitted from all of your analyses around reproductive justice. And that's his rest on the foundation of the human rights framework, because we're not going to secure and achieve reproductive justice in an intersectional way, in a universal way, in an inclusive way, if we only work within the confines of the US Constitution, which we all recognize as a slaveholder document, da 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 da. So I would just, if we really want to expand and include, make the reproductive justice framework truly inclusive as it was designed to be, we're going to have to understand that we're gonna need a new legal and moral regime to make that happen. Because the moral regime we have right now under the US Constitution privileges white supremacy, 
And you know, we can we've been fighting for 400 years to change that. But for 70 years, global South activists joined with women of color in the US have been pressing the United States to stop being a rogue country and fall in compliance with the human rights regime that we should be in, in compliance with anyway. And so I'll close my remarks at that because I really love the interpretation of reproductive justice, but that foundation of human rights, I can truly say it's not reproductive justice if you're not talking about human rights. That's a white interpretation of reproductive justice that de-radicalizes it because it removes the best weapon for challenging reproductive oppression as a form of genocide in the United States. But thank y'all. Thank you. Um, okay, well, I will open up the chat for comments um, or questions if our uh, if our viewers and if you who are here with us today, if you have uh, questions or thoughts that you want to give us. And while we're waiting for folks to um, to put some of those in the chat, I will just open it up for any of the panelists who want to talk about um, how did you come to start doing reproductive justice work? And, and so for some of you, I think that's going to be that you were doing other work that brought you this way or um, where did you start? I know, and I will offer for myself, I came to, so I am a licensed certified professional midwife here in the state of Kentucky, but I came to midwifery work through abortion work. Um, as a young person, I was a clinic escort and really grew up in the, grew up in the abortion access um, portion of sort of our, our lands, our cultural landscape. Um, so I'll invite any of the other, any of the panelists to kind of talk about how did you get here to using this? <clears throat> um, I can start. So um, my, I had, a, I had a very interesting upbringing in the sense that my mother uh, spent her, and it's, she, she's not retired, she's still in her uh, career of, of government politics and policy. Um, and I, and my father was, you know, full-time military. So I was able, you know, grew up in a very political heavy home. And one of the first organizations that I ever got involved with was the NAACP with racial justice work and uh, growing, you know, coming from that, you know, you see where many of the disparities are um, amongst, you know, Black people, and you learn about your history in America, and yes, the Constitution, uh, and all of its problems with, you know, the founders being slave owners forming the country using the Constitution, and that was really my start uh, in just any type of justice work. Uh, a lot of time spent in working with the GOTV, getting out the vote, um, workshops and you know teaching people how to register teaching people how to you know, fill out voter registration cards and the importance of voting even before I could vote myself uh, being underage but um, justice overall was always something that was a center of just you know my core beliefs and equal justice and human rights justice and and um I, you know, and going through college, I learned more about reproductive justice. I learned more about RJ through um, my women and gender studies classes that I took uh, as an area of concentration while at Northern Kentucky University. So that brought me into the scope of, of reproductive justice. And I was introduced to KHJN through um, my partner who was at one time on the board for the Kentucky Health Justice Network. So that was brought me into KHAN and learning and moving back to Louisville and, and seeing what KHAN does, how they operate and learning more uh, about legislation that is just constantly just coming into play to try to, you know, 
hinder that work was really what embedded me into RJ. I also have a question if you don't mind me asking. Um, so Ms. Ross, I, I, I was watching your, your lecture the other night and I found, I really found it very interesting and it's something that um, is not widely talk, talked about and uh, the calling out culture, which has you know grown um, much, especially in a time of, of rapid movement growth. And I just, you know, would like to hear uh, input from everyone and just like how we feel calling out culture has hindered movements and how it might has in some areas sabotaged the work by bringing attention to, you know, making, by shifting attention from the work to an individual or a group of individuals and just wanted to know thoughts and opinions on, on that. I think we have imprecise definitions of what a movement is. When people have a lot of different opinions and a lot of different perspectives and they move in the same direction, that's a movement. That's why the women's movement is not represented by one organization. The trans movement is not represented by one organization. Every movement has a lot of different opinions, but people work towards a shared goal. When people have one opinion, and they move in the same direction, that's a cult. And so I think we have imprecise definitions of what a movement is supposed to be. And when we try to apply these group think practices and impose them on a movement, I think that foments and generates the call out culture because we really do believe that the way to be in movement with somebody is to clone your thinking onto them. And, we, and that's nothing but cult behavior. That is not movement and power building behavior. Power is achieved by getting a lot of different people for their own reasons moving in the same direction, not sharing your reason to move in the same direction. And so I think that there is a, the fault I believe though, law lies with us elders because we, uh, we offer and teach so much, but we really not have taught the science of power building and base building and movement building well in many ways, because people have the mistaken idea that they have to put their pressure, the most pressure in building movement on the people who are closest to them and, and, and ideas, like I call it turning the 90% allies into 100% allies instead of actually working on the 75% allies, like for me and those of us in the reproductive justice movement, a 75% ally would be somebody like the Girl Scouts. While they don't talk about abortion rights or trans rights in the way I'd like them to, at the same time, they talk about girls and women's empowerment. So at worst, they're a problematic ally. They're not an enemy, <laughs> you know? And so we tend to treat people who don't fit into our 90% bubble as if they're an enemy. And uh, that is unstrategic in my opinion. And then outside of the Girl Scouts would be the 50 percenters as I call them. They're like my parents. I also come from a conservative military background. My daddy was a lifer in the army. <clears throat> my mother's Southern Baptist, conservative evangelical Christian in Texas. So we didn't get a lot of Sex education, as a matter of fact, I envy you, Aaron, because we didn't even get political education in my home. Uh, we were, you know, like sex, like race was never talked about in my home in, in a very specific way, even though my father joined the military in the midst of uh, orders to desegregate the military. And so it had an impact on his life. But I think like the like, like Holocaust survivors, my parents wanted to insulate their eight kids from the reality of racial rep, rep, uh, repression. And of course, living, growing up on army bases, uh, the racial repression was not as obvious as it was in the civil civilian population. So my parents are 50 percenters. And 
we don't have, a, well, my parents are gone now, but we didn't have a lot of common ground about my politics, but we had a lot of common ground about our values, even though they were expressed in different ways. So my mother would use her church programs to feed the homeless people, while I used my organizing to ask why they were homeless in the first place. So it wasn't that we agreed on strategies, but we agreed on values. But when they're, because they're 50 percenters, they can as easily be persuaded to go to the left or the right, depending, depending on who is their trusted confidant. And so if we scorn working with people because they don't particularly align with all the words we use and the particular strategies we choose, all we're doing is leaving them to be vulner, vulnerable to being recruited by our opponents. And I don't see how we benefit from strengthening the ranks of our opponents. So that's why I'm so critical of the call out culture because we're doing these political purity tests that are unstrategic and in fact, sending people who should work with us into the arms of the people who take them seriously. And I think that's, I'm passionate about that right now for us to be more strategic. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, Christy wants to say thank you for talking about the conversation that you had with your daughter um, and mentions that the uh, that intergenerational conversation is really important. So thank you. Um, and then Dr. Story, Dr. Angela Story says, thank you for your critical work and for sharing it this morning. I'm wondering how you all think academics and or educational spaces might better support RJ work here in Louisville and in Kentucky more widely. And I'll just leave that to anybody that wants to pick it up. Um, I can answer that like in healthcare uh, education. Um, I think there, there needs to be better understanding of the social determinants of health and the fact that race is not the risk factor, but racism is, which is something I did not understand until I started do, uh, doing some research to do a um, presentation on Black maternal mortality just a few years ago. And that was a huge eye awakening for me that to stop thinking of it as race is the risk factor, but racism is. And it really opened my eyes and helped me look at things differently and look at how maybe we can change our practice differently. But that needs to be taught and it's not taught um, in that way. Um, and then I think we just need uh, with academics and with research from like the public health uh, realm, we just need more data um, so that we understand what we are doing. Um, and we need some research to understand how to um, tackle the issue of racism um, in healthcare. So, you know, when I talk about it at the state level, okay, we got to deal with this. Everyone freezes because we don't know how to fix structural racism in healthcare. <laughs> So, you know, they're like, yeah, we want to fix it, but how do you fix that? And so I think we need the research from the academics to, to, to understand what actually works. Um, I feel like from, from where I, you know, where I am, I need government and policy to be taught as a core curriculum because I'm a poly, I, I majored in political science. So I, that was my whole bubble. Like, that's all I ever did was in undergrad was understand. But then I, I later learned that a lot of my peers did not even get a hint of what I got in understanding how our government works. So I was around a lot of people where we wanted to create change. We wanted to do all these things and we were upset at how the world was and how racist the world was, but no one could tell me how it got that way through government. No one could tell me how, you know, certain laws that are currently in place, um, that one, they existed, and two, how they impacted uh, our society. And I think uh, from school, like from, like, I guess, middle school through high school and college, outside of the field that I was in, um, there was not an understanding of just like how 
things work, right? And so I ended up having a lot of peers who, you know, who would come out and want to get you know, right into activism, right into um, change work. And they quickly became disappointed because they didn't understand the, the matrix of not just the federal government or they only understood the federal government but didn't understand how the state government operated or local government operated, right? Um, there's like a layer of, of I, I call it like, I guess rose colored glasses that I think can be taken off through academia, but it has to be incorporated. Like the way that they butcher social studies across the board is, is quite disgraceful. Um, so people are, are in school unaware of their rights uh, that they have as, as individuals and human beings and members of states. People are unaware of, of what they can do, how they can affect change, how they can affect, create policy and help write policy and then get a proponent to, you know, advocate for, you know, and it's, I'm, you know, I, I, it's set up that way intentionally, I think, uh, to further disenfranchise people um, and create, and to keep um, people from, you know, having access to that political like power that each of us possess, right? So I think that's one way, one major way that academia or just education overall, it doesn't have to be, because not everyone has, you know, will go to college or attend the college. So there is privilege of just being able to go to, to, uh, to college or to university. But even in high schools and middle schools, you know, there needs to be an overall um, reform in that area, right? So that's my, my two cents. I will add to that, that we just saw um, Dr. Dawson Edwards speak at, at testify in Frankfurt um, last week. And what she was talking about was um, police violence and, and defunding the police and really trying to have a similar conversation to the one that we're having here and, it, and, and expand the scope of understanding around these kinds of issues. And so the academic, the, what I see as helpful from the, from the academy is going to be creating knowledge that is, that we're able to disseminate in ways that attack very specific chunks of what's happening. It's kind of like what Damara said, right? Like, well, we want to fix it. And the fix is not a fit. There's not a fix. And so I think academics who are willing to do that kind of policy work is really valuable. Um, I want to, we've got just a, another couple of minutes and, um, Dr. Kate Fossil, our director, who I also want to say thank you to um, for our bringing uh, Loretta Ross to our lecture last night and for um, being here today. So, but uh, Dr. Fossil asks, Loretta, could you say a bit more concretely about how embedded RJ and other movement and other movement work in the human rights framework? Um, it's not a discourse that is very familiar in the US, so thanks. Yes. When we created the human rights, I mean, the reproductive justice framework in June of 1994, we were privileged to go to Cairo at, to the International Conference on Population and Development a few months later. And we learned from the Global South, the activists in the Global South, how they were using the human rights framework to make stronger and better claims for the same rights that we were failing to achieve under the US constitutional framework. And so we quickly, rested reproductive justice on the eight categories of human rights protections to which all people are entitled, but particularly the category of social human rights, which includes the human right to health, to education, to social security, welfare, unemployment, and a whole lot of other economic and, and educational. There's a human right to education under social human rights. And the eighth category, which is called sexual human rights, the rights to bodily autonomy, gender identity, right to have children, not to have children, et cetera, are the right to sexual pleasure. So you find that you can strengthen the advocacy for reproductive justice by really articulating it, not only as a human rights framework, 
but then you're able to define the people who are opposed to your human rights more clearly as human rights violators. And I find that very useful. And so it really is, and, and for example, uh, under cultural human rights, freedom of religion is a human right, but so is freedom from religion. So it's really a human rights violation to have people's other religious views upon someone who doesn't share that religion. And even if he shared the religion, you still have the human right to not obey its edict. And so we're in the midst of the normalization of human rights violations that the US government is desperate for us not to call attention to. As a matter of fact, this past Monday, the US government was in a review committee by the United Nations for its human rights violations. And the world, the, most of the country is even aware that this takes place. And it's because they have intentionally branded human rights as a sovereignty invading communist idea that we don't have to pay attention to because we're the exceptional country of the United States are too great to listen to how other countries think of us and our practices. So I, I think we do ourselves as a, a ill service with our lack of knowledge about human rights and the way we're failing to really use it effectively as, as people around the, in the Global South are doing. Thank you. And that pulls us right to, I think, the very end. And so I want to say thank you so much for um, to all of our panelists for being here and for Ms. Ross. Thank you so much for um, spending the last couple of days with us uh, here at the Ambraden Institute. Um, I also just, again, want to take another moment to say thank you to Dr. Fossil. Um, she is going to be um, working on uh, reducing her workload here at the ABI next semester. She's still going to be here, um, but it's going to be stepping down as director. And this is, uh, I hope, an excellent feather in her cap in terms of um, accomplishments for, for her tenure here. So thank you, Dr. Fossil. Um, and our panelists, thank you so much, everybody. And thank you for coming. We're all done. Thank you. Take care, everyone.